On December 10, 2022, Heather Kelly called home to her kids to tell them she'd be home soon. But Heather never did make it home that night. And when her truck was found the next day, Heather wasn't with it. Instead, it was found on fire. And once the flames were doused, inside, blood and hair was found. Now, five months later, Heather still hasn't been found, and her disappearance looks more like a homicide. Hey everyone, I hope you're doing well and you're having a good day. Thank you so much for joining me to watch this video about the missing woman, Heather Kelly. Heather, who is from Portage, Michigan, has unfortunately been missing for more than five months now. At 9 p.m. on December 10, 2022, 35-year-old Heather Kelly told her children that she was going to downtown Kalamazoo to pick up her boyfriend, who has not been publicly named. Later, at 10.20 p.m. that night, Heather called home and gave her children an update and told them she'd be home soon. Only, Heather never came home that night. And that's something that this mother of eight, who was very dedicated and absolutely loved her children, would not have done. She wouldn't leave her children alone with no word, and she definitely wouldn't have told them that she was on her way home just to never come home. Because of that, Heather was reported missing on December 11th with the Portage Public Safety Department. This report was taken seriously from the beginning, which is something we don't always see, and the search for Heather began that very day. Later that same day, as police and Heather's family were searching for Heather, her cousin was driving around and actually spotted Heather's car on the side of the road. She noticed it in the area of South Sprinkle Road and East Michigan Avenue. And this is both shocking and lucky, but Heather's car had just been set on fire. Like, just set on fire, so it was barely starting to have any sort of flames in it. As this cousin pulled over to look at Heather's car, a red truck would race away from this area. The tires were squealing, it immediately drew attention to itself because this red pickup rushed off so quickly. But luckily, because Heather's cousin had gotten there so quickly, she was able to call authorities immediately and they were able to put out the fire before anything was destroyed. After the fire had been put out, investigators were able to look in Heather's truck. Inside, they found large amounts of blood and they found hair that was the same color as Heather's. DNA tests would later confirm that both the blood and hair belonged to Heather Kelly. Nearby, a pile of clothes would also be found, and DNA has since confirmed that they were in fact Heather's. Obviously, it would take a little while before DNA confirmed all of this, but given that there was a large amount of blood found in Heather's car on this very first day, that clothes were found nearby, and that no one had seen or heard from Heather, they very much suspected her to be a victim of foul play. And so they began doing their best to try to retrace her steps and hopefully find her in time to help her. Investigators obtained security footage from a Speedway gas station in Comstock, Michigan. The security footage showed that Heather was outside this gas station at around 10 p.m. So that would have been just before Heather called home. This gas station was about three miles from where Heather's car would later be found. Also, a police officer would come forward later to say that he had been on patrol in the area that her car was found about 16 hours before her car was found and set on fire. The officer had left the car there and tagged it as abandoned, so that means that it was very likely there either the night of December 10th or in the very early hours of the morning of December 11th. Even with all this information, in the first days of Heather's missing persons case, investigators were very hopeful that they would be able to find her, save her, and bring her home to her family. Given that, despite the amount of blood found in her car, they decided to leave this a missing persons case to try to find her. In a press conference on December 19, 2022, discussing Heather's disappearance, Sheriff Fuller shared that the police already had a person of interest in regard to Heather's disappearance. So just to clarify, a person of interest isn't the same thing as a suspect in the case. As a matter of fact, they aren't even someone that police necessarily think could have had something to do with the actual crime involved. Rather, they are someone who's believed to know more about the missing person, the circumstances and the hours before they went missing, where they may want to go, things like that. So... This, they were declaring that this person was someone they wanted to talk to, but not necessarily someone that they believed was involved. Now, that's not to say that a person of interest can't become a suspect later on or even be arrested down the road if they 
are found to know a lot more than police thought they did, but just wanted to clarify that a person of interest is not the same thing as a suspect. This person of interest was originally not publicly identified during the press conference, but Heather's family has since confirmed that the man she was seeing is this person of interest. Sheriff Fuller said during this conference, we believe that person has some information that can help us locate our missing person. Heather's family has talked a lot about this man that she's been dating on and off. At this time, this man has not been identified publicly by police or by Heather's family. So during this video, he'll just be referred to as her boyfriend. Heather and this man's relationship has been described as on and off again, but beyond that bit of information, not much has been shared about the actual state of their relationship. And on the night of December 10th, the last night Heather was seen, she had told her children that she was going to see her boyfriend. It has been widely reported that this man has a very concerning criminal history. This man has most recently served time for federal convictions, which include both drug convictions and a conviction for a murder for hire plot. This man was released from federal prison in July of 2022. He was transferred to what is called community confinement. This is a halfway house that is operated by the Bureau of Prisons Detroit Residential Reentry Management Office. The purpose of halfway houses is to help those who have served their time or are paroled integrate back into society. It is literally a halfway point between prison and the rest of the world. Usually with these houses, there's a very low point of rent because these people are just getting jobs again and there are specific rules they have to follow. Usually they have to be in by a certain time unless they have specific permission because of their jobs and even then they would have a curfew set specific to them. The man Heather was seeing was also released with what's called a tether. That means he would be tracked through a GPS device and he could only be within a certain area. After Heather went missing, obviously this man was the first person they wanted to look into. And as they began their investigation, the discoveries they made would be both concerning and damning. It was discovered that the night Heather went missing that his cell phone had been turned off for a period of time, and a few days later, he'd actually removed his tether. Because of this, he was listed as an escapee from federal custody and AWOL from the halfway house on December 12th, two days after Heather was last seen. Later, police would find this electronic tether not too far away from the halfway house. It didn't take too long for police to find him, and on December 14, 2022, this man was arrested and taken to the Nuevo County Jail. When he was arrested, and as of this time, he has not been charged with anything in relation to Heather's disappearance. It has also been reported that a witness at the halfway house shared with police that on the night Heather went missing, when the man came back to the halfway house, he had deep scratches on his chest and back. All of this obviously looks really bad, because it is, but this man and his defense attorney have given the court several arguments and reasons as to why none of this actually means he's involved. According to the boyfriend, the last time he saw Heather was mid-afternoon on December 10th. Investigators, though, have found that phone records and the GPS of his tether show that he and Heather were together at a private dinner club in Kalamazoo called the Park Club later that night. He worked there as a busboy, so these phone records and GPS records support what Heather's children have shared with police about her saying that she was going to see her boyfriend later that night. Records show that after they were together, but before they left the Park Club, he turned off his phone. Later, it would be tracked back to the area of East Michigan Avenue and South Sprinkle Road after it had been turned back on. And let's not forget that that's the exact area where Heather's car was found. I will say that I don't know exactly what near means in this case. Um, we do know that phone records can be a little iffy on exact GPS data based on Wi-Fi and you know, phone towers and things like that, but I do believe he still had his tether on at this point because he didn't remove it for two days after she went missing. So I would think that that GPS data would still be pretty accurate, but it hasn't been shared what that data says because they've just talked about his cell phone being turned back on in this area. An important detail to know is that the halfway house is only about two miles away from where Heather's car was found. So if they're talking about near in relation to phone towers and how all that GPS data works, there could be a chance that it bounced off a different tower that was closer to where her car was found rather than closer to the halfway house. But like I said, I'm 
sure that the tether data tells a lot more and that's probably what they're keeping to the side for this time being. And because I gave that information, I think it's also important to note that investigators have said outright that they believe him turning off his cell phone before they left the park club that night shows premeditation, that he knew he was going to do something bad to Heather before they left that night. They also believe that this supports that Heather has likely, tragically, been the victim of violent crime. And if all that didn't sound crazy enough already, police records show that he requested a new cell phone number on December 11th, so the exact day after Heather went missing. That also means it was directly between when Heather went missing on the 10th and when he went AWOL on the 12th. After he was arrested for fleeing federal custody, the man provided the federal judge with a letter explaining why he had run. He claimed that Heather's brother texted him death threats and sent him pictures of an AR-15 assault rifle as a threat. He said he filed a police report about this incident, but that hasn't been confirmed at this time, and Heather's brother has since publicly denied making these threats. Also in this letter, the man requested compassionate release from the judge because he said he needed some sort of heart surgery, but that's been denied at the time. I mean, people get health care in prison, so that's a hard argument to make. And honestly, he was already on parole, so the fact that he went AWOL, no matter what the circumstances were, means that he doesn't get to get back out. You know, he broke the conditions of his parole and so hopefully he's getting the care he needs while also being locked up for the time being. So I want to take a few minutes to talk about some other information in this case, and then I'll come back to the boyfriend and some of the recent updates that have come out about this case. From what I've read, Heather and the father of her children were together for a long time, but they'd never been married. Apparently, they just grew apart, and that's why their relationship ended about two years ago. It's been shared that the children have been in very close contact with their father since Heather's disappearance and that, honestly, I don't think the police are looking in his direction at all. He doesn't really seem to be someone that they are interested in as a person of interest or a suspect. Um, it seems like he's been cleared and all of that already. Overall, there have been more than six massive searches for Heather. There has been a helicopter search in the area where her truck was found, and dive teams have searched the pond in the same area near Sprinkle Road, as well as all the ponds in the area. These searches began immediately after Heather's car was found and have continued both in this area and in others ever since then. And sadly, in February of 2023, Heather's case was escalated to a homicide investigation. It has been shared that the man she was seeing at the time she disappeared has been wholly uncooperative in this investigation. As shown by the records police have gathered, he has allegedly lied to police several times. And beyond that, he just hasn't been helpful. Sheriff Fuller has also shared that he believes that one or more people are involved. It is likely that they are involved in the disposal of evidence and setting Heather's car on fire. Sheriff Fuller is quoted as saying, we know that it's likely someone helped with the burning of the vehicle and the possible destruction of other evidence, and that a person or people are also a person of interest in this investigation. This person or persons have been identified by police, but none of them are currently charged or in custody. The man we've talked about so much in this video currently has not been charged or is in custody for anything to do with Heather's disappearance. He is currently just being held at the moment for fleeing federal custody. As it stands now, he is scheduled to be released from federal prison on April 26, 2023. For the time being, Heather's eight children have been staying with her brother and sister-in-law, Todd and Stacy Kelly. They have been caring for their nieces and nephews alongside their own two kids since before Christmas. Not completely sure why their father doesn't have custody or why he hasn't been taking care of them as well. Um, they have been in close contact, so I don't really know anything about that. That hasn't been shared publicly. But Todd and Stacy really do are doing all they absolutely can to take care of these children. And I know the search for Heather is still absolutely ongoing. The FBI is now offering a $20,000 reward for information that leads to authorities locating Heather. 
Heather Kelly is a 35 year old woman who is about 5 foot 8 and approximately 125 pounds. She has long blonde hair and brown eyes. She also has various tattoos. In some of the pictures I've seen, she's wearing glasses. I haven't seen it mentioned if she was wearing them on the night she was last seen, but I did want to make sure to mention them. If you have any information regarding Heather's disappearance or her whereabouts, please call one of the following numbers. You can call the Kalamazoo County Sheriff's Office at 269-383-8748. The FBI Detroit Field Office at 313-965-2323. And if you have immediate information, you can always call 911.